remember, please remember that when things get rough, you can always leave over there and come here to Sankofa Books and sit down and relax. Because this is the liberation space and the liberation zone. but just uh, an examination of the history, uh, the ups and downs, the success and failure of Pan-Africanism as concept, as a concept and as an action, and as a practical uh, idea. And it's looking, for all of us who are interested, in really looking at uh, <coughs> no way it will, searching for its new meaning, new. Uh, new character and what it should be looking like, it would be the best opportunity. So we will inform you, uh, we will by email tell you, and then we will tell you or mail to you the reading uh, documentations, or we'll ask you to come by at least two weeks before uh, class begins to have the reading materials available to you. Registration, reading materials, you go, you read two weeks, you come back, and he'll tell you also more, but now real work begins. For him and us, the real work begins, from my view. And uh, again, I want to, I want you to help me well, again, uh, give our, I know we don't do it at the end, but just let's give him a nice applause. <laughs> Well, first of all, let me just say that I'm really looking forward to the next two because all, what we are, have done and will do this evening contains a large measure of theory, but it is theory tied to practice. And let me start off by saying, I think I said it in the beginning, but let me say it again. And we operate on the basis that Theory without action. Theory without action is futile. Right? But action without theory is usually ineffective. And that therefore, when we are serious, we have to combine theory and practice. So what I've given you is the theory, but I have based, I've tried to let you know that the theory that I'm giving you is not just some vague ideas because I've given you examples of how the theory works and how it is applied. The question, however, is that when you get into the real thing, you know, is that you go in a class and and teach you, like when you finish medical school. If you go to medical school, and you could be the graduated top of your class, when you go now to take care of a live patient or a sick patient, it's a different story. <laughs> Some people just freeze. They can't do it. You know that? The same thing with a lawyer. They go to law school, and you go to mock trial and you do wonderful. But when you get the, your first client and you appear before that judge, that's a different story. <laughs> because now you're being paid to do your work. Everybody's watching you, the judge is watching. And if you mess up, you ain't getting no more clients for a long time. In medicine, if you mess up, somebody dies. Right? So now that is where we are. So we're going to finish this, and then we're going to talk about the real world, how the thing works in the real world. And that is what we are being taught. The next two sessions is about Pan-Africanism. Because up until now, a lot of people do not understand 
what happened to the Pan-African movement. And I go to meetings and I hear people cussing each other and blaming individuals. And this individual said that and that group didn't cooperate with that group. Hmm? And they have no understanding of what happened. Because when we try to tell them what was happening, they said, no, it can't be true. People wouldn't do that. Well, we have the documentation now. And we know what happened. And we will be sharing it with you. But to continue <coughs> at the theoretical level, with an element of the practical, come on in, my brother. Let me just add why I interrupted for a second. Uh, we will have, by the way, during the, when we prepare the material, we'll have all the lectures on DVD in advance. So you can go over them. But I'll tell you, yesterday I was, I just began already reading. You're not involved in it. Let us assume, because Obama is running and could be president, let us assume that you were running and you could become president of the U.S. Do we, would you feel comfortable planning for the whole of the U.S. as to what the U.S. should be like 30 years from now? Would you, could you undertake that task? Hmm? Anybody in this room feel that they could undertake the task of planning for the U.S., what will the U.S. be like 30, 50 years from? Because whereas in the third world, we plan for every five years. In the U.S., we plan in units of 25 years. The plan for 2025 was finished in the year 2000. The plan for 2025 was finished in the year 2000, and since then, we're working on the plan for 2050, <laughs> right? <clears throat> that is, no, most people don't even know that. So the planning phase at that level is not a five-year plan, is not a 10-year plan, is not a 15-year plan, it's a 25-year plan, and it is modified every year based on new data. Now, I'm cutting it short because the, 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 the plan for, for the year 2025 30 is known now. And the you and let me do it an, another way. Let me do it another way. At the theoretical level. is action. If you're planning for the entire United States, you have to develop an objective. The objective involves one major objective and two specific objectives. I'm using what is happening to demonstrate this. The major objective that has been agreed upon is global dominance. That is agreed. So when you think George Bush is mad, he's not the only madman because he didn't come up with the objective. He, has only, he was only elected to implement the objective. He was handpicked and elected <coughs> because he agrees with the objective. They couldn't handpick and elect somebody who doesn't agree with the objective. But the detailed work that led up to that, he wasn't involved in that. So whether he's around or not, 
is a huge number of people who did the work, who arrived at the decision that the objective is global dominance. That is why he has Cheney, because Cheney belonged to a think tank that did a lot of that work. So did Rumsfeld. And so did a number of other people in the administration. They are the ones who do the actual work. But since he agrees with the objective of global dominance, all you have to say, Mr. President, are you still in agreement with global? He says, yes. So, well, if you wish to achieve global dominance, this is what you have to do. And then he might say, no, we need to do a little more. So the difference between a Bush and any other president is merely the enthusiasm with which they implement it. <laughs> do you understand that? That is the only difference. It is not whether it is going to be implemented. It is merely the enthusiasm and efficiency with which they implement it. So anytime you run for president, you are running to do that. Because that can't change for the next 25 years. It is only a matter of how you're doing it. So that if, for example, the objective was to whip Leo Edwards 10 times a day into submission, right? The person elected might say, oh God, I know him in the world. We can only, only whip him five times. But you're whipping the hell out of me any damn how. You understand? Mm -hmm. You understand that? Yes. All right. Now, In order to achieve that objective, because the average person don't know, this is open to all kinds of definition. In order to achieve global dominance, it means you have to achieve, you have to be the most powerful country at all levels of power. And then the question arises, what are the levels <coughs> of power. And the levels of power are as follows. Military power, right? Meaning the use of force in one form or another. Economic power, right? And that means in broad terms, the giving or withholding of the means of, library, of livelihood. Hmm? Who do you want to control the wealth? Who do you want not to have the wealth? Hmm? <clears throat> there is political power. And political power means, in the final analysis, the ability to mobilize, organize, and utilize large numbers of people to achieve specific objectives. That is political power. You talk about people power. Right? Then comes psychological power. That is the ability to control the minds of people. Because let, let me just back up a little bit and explain to you what power means. See, if you do physics, if you're in, in the physical sciences and you do physics, power means something very specific. And there's an equation that we can write about. But when in the social sciences, that's not what we're talking about. <coughs> that we're not talking about that. In the social sciences, power means the ability to influence the, th the thinking and behavior of other human beings. That's what power is in the social sciences. The ability to influence the thinking and behavior of other human beings. That is power. 
and you do it by military power, that is the threat or use of force. You do it by economic power, that is the giving or withholding the means of livelihood. You do it by political power, that is, by, that is to say, by mobilizing, organizing, utilizing large numbers of human beings to achieve specific objectives. You do it by psychological power, which is mind control, that is figuring out what to say to people, what to do to get people to do what you want them to do. Right? And the other one is part of that is, is what we, we call information, which is the media. That's where the media and history books and all these things. What information do you feed to people in order to get them to do what you want them to do? Right? Now, <clears throat> In the last 15 years, the technology has been developed in what we call information technology. And we can communicate across the globe to anybody in, in two seconds. And if we control the means of doing that, we can control what everybody in the world thinks. Right? So here we have a situation what is the point? Listen to this. What is the point of having 10,000 outlets if you only have one source? So it means that wherever you are, or whatever you turn to, you, you think it is 1,000 independent commentaries, but it is all coming from one source. Now, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but we're moving toward that. The latest study shows that in the Western world, right, information is now coming out of a maximum of five sources. And if you look at, at um, Murdoch, who is buying up, that is the reason why Murdoch is buying up everything. Because you can then go anywhere in this country or anywhere in Europe, turn on any radio station, any television, <coughs> read any newspaper that you want, get the feeling that you're getting a different point of view, when in fact it is all coming from Murdoch and his corporation. But he feeds slightly, he uses slightly different words in different forms, but it's the same source. Right? After you develop, have this objective, this is A, you have to develop a strategy. <coughs> For achieving that objective. So, if you know that the objective is global dominance, that in order to achieve global dominance, it means you must be the most powerful with respect to military power, with respect to economic power, with respect to political power, with respect to psychological power, with respect to information power. Otherwise, you can't be global dominant. Then what is the strategy? And so the strategy that has been agreed upon is called the concept of total warfare. Total warfare. <coughs> Most people, when you use the word warfare, think you're talking about military warfare. And that used to be. But when the US, after the Soviet Union fell, and the US decided they are going to control the world for the 21st century, and that is written. I mean, this is not, I'm not, this is not, this is written. 
I'm very clear about it. They said, rather than using military power by itself, or political power by itself, or economic power by itself, we have to do all of that simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But in different combinations, depending on time, place, and circumstances. You understand that? So, when, because you don't see military forces in a country, doesn't mean that country is not being subjected to warfare. Because warfare continues. Take, for example, just in foreign policy. There are two aspects to foreign policy. One is above the table, one is under the table. The, on, the over the table is run out of the State Department, the under the table is run out of the CIA, under the CIA. What you see and read about is the one that is over the table coming out of the State Department. But the one that is affecting people every day more intimately is the one under the table which is covert, and you don't know about. Take, for example, the case of Zimbabwe. And I'm going to pause and do this, because I know people get mad with me, but you know, I'm going to do this. Everybody is angry with Mugabe. Because on the face of it, Mugabe is a terrible fellow. He's doing some very bad thing, and he is. He's doing some very bad thing. But you see, what if you are sitting at a table and somebody has a sword under the table and they're sticking you with the sword under the, the table <laughs> and nobody sees that this man is sticking you with a sword under the table and while he's sticking you with the sword he's saying, you're such a charming lady. We should get to know each other, and I'm going to the hell out of you with a, with a sword while I'm telling you that. And all of a sudden, you jump and slap me. And everybody said, but Dooman is mad. Here's the man making a pass at her, and she slapped him. Because they didn't see that I was sticking you under the table with a sword. All right, now let me tell you what has happened in Zimbabwe. Because I have an argument. I, I'm chairman of Trans Africa, Washington, D.C. Chaplain, I have a problem even with my own people on this one. When Rhodesia was fighting for its independence, they couldn't come because it was decided that three countries on planet Earth would always be white. The U.S., South Africa, and Rhodesia. That was a decision taken. These three countries would always be what, and no, blacks were never going to rule them. We arrived at the position where it was an impasse, and at the Commonwealth meeting, Michael Manley, then Prime Minister of Jamaica, wrote a proposal for solving the problem, <coughs> which he presented to the Commonwealth Conference, and they approved it. On the basis of that, we got the British government to agree to it. They, the British government, used their influence with the U.S. government, who then came back and said, boy, we have to, we can't win this one. That is how Zimbabwe became independent. I know that because I was involved in that. The agreement called for, because the fight was over land, land reform. The agreement called for Mugabe to buy the land from the white farmers and distribute it to Africans. But Mugabe didn't have any money. So it was agreed that the British government would give, because they said, Mugabe said, I am not buying the land. Listen to this now. This is and I'm, I'm deviating, but it's, it's all right. She said, I'm not paying for the land because the white man didn't pay for the land when he took it. This land belonged to the Africans. 
the white man came in and took the land and paid nothing for it. Therefore, I am not going to pay for the land. So we got the British, the British government to agree that they would pay for, for the land. Mugabe, but any, if there was improvement to the land, Mugabe would pay for that. You understand? All right. So the British government was supposed to give Mugabe money to purchase the land. He would then distribute it to blacks, and he would pay whites compensation for whatever improvements they had made on the land. Right? Well, they didn't give them any money. They have still haven't given them money. But now, we know that there are a lot of minerals in Zimbabwe that they want. So there's a little a tiff around between the US and Europe. And, the, and Europe said, if you want to treat us as junior partners, we have more experience than you. We want to go and control all the mineral and raw materials in Africa. So that when your economy gets in trouble, we will be sitting easy. So we've been having all these proxy wars in Africa. And people are saying, look at those creatures killing each other. All these things are proxy wars. Every time a European country decided to grab an African territory, some other country or the US send another army to oppose them. Because there's a fight going on between Europe and, and the US who will control the mineral resources and raw materials of Africa. So now the British decide we're going to grab Zimbabwe. So they launch a covert action against Mugabe. They went to the people and said, listen, you have been independent for 20 odd years, and Mugabe has betrayed you because he promised you land and he hasn't given you the land, which is true. They don't say why he hasn't given them the land. Now, Mugabe has a short fuse. And one of the things that you need to learn in the real world, if you want to rule a country, you better learn self-control. Because if every time you get stuck, you, you jump up and hit somebody, you will lose every time. If the other man appears to be cool and you appear to be aggressive, you, in the eyes of the world, you're going to lose every time. But it is that quality that caused Mugabe to win when he was fighting in the jungle. Hmm? So sometimes a quality that is good in one circumstance is bad in another. But Garvey does not like anybody messing with him. He loses his cool very quickly. We all know that. So when they decided to play this game, and they began to move, and you remember this had it marches? So poor people who came by food, nothing. All of a sudden, they were arriving in Harare in convoys, going around marching, waving banners eating at rest. Where the hell are they getting the money from? Mm -hmm. Somebody had to be paying for it. When we checked out, out and this is known, so I can, the CIA was supporting British intelligence in the, and still are in this thing. Mugabe got angry and said, if you want to play that game, I can play it too. So he said to the people, the reason why I haven't given you the land because they didn't give me the money to buy the land. So since they're playing this game, go and take the land, and you know what happened. Now that is what you saw. You saw when he told the people, go and take the land. They went and took the land, and in the process, some whites got killed. And then they said, look at this horrible man who consciously sent his people to take the land and to kill white people. And, and then the, really, the propaganda really started. Which made him more angry, and he said, listen, you ain't going to beat me at that game, because if you want to talk trick, I am trick. I'm trickier than you. 
And this is the fight that is going on. That is the reason why SATC, Southern African Development Corporation, consisting of South Africa, Botswana, Mozambique, Namibia, have refused to issue a statement opposing Mugabe because they know they are next on the list. <coughs> You understand that? No. They don't agree. No. They're telling the world that South Africa is betraying itself and its moral values by refusing to condemn Mugabe. But what they're not telling the world that's because South African countries know that it is a covert action to overthrow Mugabe and to control the raw resources, mineral resources, of the Zimbabwe. So they've had a number of conferences, and SADC, Southern African Development Corporation, has refused to issue a statement condemning Mugabe. Now, if you don't know the full story, it looks bad because when you get down to that kind of fighting, that ain't nice fighting. That is good to fight. <laughs> and people get hurt. And Mugabe is therefore doing things which, in fact, are in violation of the Declaration of Human Rights. But if you were in Mugabe's place, what would you do under those circumstances? You understand? No. <laughs> so what I'm trying to tell you is that when you sit on the outside and just read the papers, things can look very clear. But when you know the truth, it ain't that easy. Not that easy. And Mugabe has said, I am not, they have to kill me. I'm, they're not, I'm not going to let them win this one. And sad C is in a, a dilemma because if they ever give up Mugabe, they, they don't know which one is going to be next. Because they're coming out of all, all of them. Because all of them have a holy minerals. Right? The same thing in the Congo. That is what is happening in the Congo. 70% of the wealth of Africa is in that region, the Great Lakes. Region. That's what it's all about. So don't go by what you read in the papers. The papers are information warfare. They tell you what they want to tell you in order to win your support. That's information warfare. Right? Now, total warfare says, therefore, that if we remember now, I told you that the data. The official data says the white population was 30% in 1970. In 2000, it was down to 20%. And by 2050, they're going to be down to 15%. I didn't say that. The data, and the British, and, I mean, the, um, the US Census has confirmed that. What is more, they say, in the US, this is what is frightening now, in the US, the white population that was 70% was originally thought to be down, that was going to be down to 54% in 250. They have just redone the study and found they're going to be down to 47%. They just published the damn thing about five weeks ago. That the white population of the United States by 2050 will be down to 47%. Now, this is panic time. <laughs> if you were to dominate the world and you are having problems when you are at 30, how are you going to do it when you're down to 15? So this concept of total warfare strategy has been reinforced. And Bush reinforced it by adding the concept of preemptive warfare. That was his reinforcement. He said, I don't have to wait until you come at me. If I go to bed and dream <laughs> that you could 
come at me 20 years from now. Not tomorrow. If I go to bed and I dream that you could come at me 20 years from now, I have the right tomorrow morning to undertake a preemptive strike on you up to and including a nuclear first strike. Go and read the, the national strategy, security strategy of the United States, September 22nd, 2002, signed by George W. Bush. It is, you can, it's on the internet, it's on the White House blog, it, um, thing. You can go anywhere, you can go to the government printing office and get it. That, that's what it says. And it says, we will not permit any country or group of countries to rise to the level where they can challenge the dominant, not supremacy, because there's a difference between supremacy and dominance. They say that supremacy means you have an enemy who is a worthwhile enemy whom you can eventually overcome, i.e. the Soviet Union. Dominance means there is no body who can challenge you. Therefore, you can do anything you want, wherever you want, whenever you want. And that is why during the Cold War, the, the major objective was not global dominance, right? It was global supremacy, meaning eventually we will overcome the Soviet Union. Since the Soviet Union shift died, right? They shifted from global supremacy to global dominance. That's why I tell you again, be careful about language because people say, what is the difference? There ain't no difference between supremacy and... There is, by their definition, a significant difference between supremacy and dominance. That is why it says, we will not permit any country or group of countries to rise to the level where they can challenge the dominance of the United States and its allies. And that is a direct quote. I'm, I'm repeating verbatim what is in the document. He then says, <coughs> our objective of global dominance is to spread freedom and democracy into every corner of planet Earth. But then what you don't notice, he redefines democracy. And he said, I ain't talking about Greek democracy. I'm talking about something called free market democracy. <laughs> but most people have not noticed that. Free market democracy is a different thing from Greek democracy. And he says, if you have an election and the election is totally free and fair and you elect a government fairly, but that government then adopts an economic policy that is not based on free market principles, we reserve the right to, to promote regime change by any means necessary up to and including a nuclear first strike. Dr. Lee, what's the name of this document again exactly? Eh? The name of this document again exactly. The National Security Strategy of the United States, September 22nd, 2002, signed by George Bush, George W. Bush. Right? Now that is where we are. So the strategy is total warfare. So while they, they, while they may not write about it, while you may not see it, every country on planet Earth is being subjected to total warfare simultaneously. No, in different countries, different things are emphasized. Now, if I come at you, and you surrender quickly, I don't have to use military force. And the thing that I discussed with you last week about divide and rule, 
Because if, if I flatter you and you give me give, surrender right away after flattery, I don't need to go any further. But if flattery don't work, they're coming at you with force. If that don't work, they're coming at you with psychological warfare. If that don't work, they're coming at you with information warfare. Coming at you with all of this. But eventually, I'm going to win. Right? So that we are still told that we are winning in Iraq. Because by definition, we can't lose. <laughs> and if it means that in order to win, we have to bomb Iran and Syria, we do that. Because we cannot lose. Because he who is divinely ordained to rule cannot be wrong. And if I am divinely ordained, I can't be wrong. And that's what the gentleman says. He says he's divinely ordained. He's a born again Christian. So nothing that he proposes by definition can be wrong. You understand that? Yeah. Now that is the dangerous world in which we are living. Now, after that strategy is applied, it means that each of these people have to go out and develop tactics. Right? That's A, D, C. So you start out with objective, strategy, and tactics. What do tactics mean? The military have to come up with precise military plans, right, for each region and each country within the region. So the military has a plan for invading and conquering every country on planet Earth because the U.S. has divided the world up until now into four, it is now five, it has added Africa, five regions, and each one is presided over by a military officer. And even the ambassadors in the countries within that region report up, most people don't, report up to that military person. It is a military man who is in charge of, he, the ambassador is only in charge of the region, of the country in which he is. But all ambassadors within a region report up to the military commander of that region. Okay? Now, <clears throat> that is where we are. The military, therefore, don't ask whether there's a plan for this or a plan for that. The answer is yes. A competent, the, 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 a competent military has a plan for every damn thing. Otherwise, you're fired. You can't be chief of staff and don't have a plan for everything. You have to have a plan for every country within your region under every circumstance. Now, you may never use it. But you have it sitting in on the shelf, so in case it is needed. And the man said, okay, we want to start with low, you have a plan for low. We want to go to medium, you have, you have, you see, it's like the, the color coding mm -hmm. on the terror chart. Well, that is the way it is coded. So when, when the president says, no, we're going to start pressuring the military, but well, let us start at the bottom level. If they don't give it, then we move up. If they don't give in, then we move up, right? The military, have, all they do, they go and they pull out the plan that is already there. <coughs> they revise it in terms of current circumstances and bring it up to date. Now, those plans, precise plans for each country, on the, is what is called tactical planning. This thing is called strategic planning. Right? No, most countries don't have the ability <coughs> to do this kind of planning. We don't have the resources to do this kind of planning. So, since we don't want to get frightened by this, we pretend as if it doesn't exist. <coughs> right? But on the action side,
objectives give rise to policy. So when you're getting ready for action now, you have to work to some plan also. This, this is the, the, the theory piece over here. Here, the objectives give rise to policy. It's called, when you are acting, not called objective, it's called policy. The policy gives rise to programs. Programs come from strategy, right? And tactics give rise to projects. planning for the entire United States, you first work out this side of it, the theoretical side, then you send people who are head of the different departments to come with policy, programs and projects. And when they come back, you review them and modify them, and finally you come up with this. Where for every objective, there must be a policy, for the strategy, there must be a series of programs. For the, for the tactics, there must be a series of projects. Now, in our daily lives, what we are subjected to are the projects. That's what we know about. And we don't react until our lives are impacted by projects. But by that time, it is late. It's like when, as I told you before, when something is being debated in the Congress, right, that is when the policy is being formulated. And once the policy is formulated, it becomes legal and it must give rise to programs and projects, right? must give rise to programs and projects. Now what happens when the people come in and say, well, all right, we want to move you out of Southwest. And we want to put up a different kind of building. Then you start to march. Because you can't afford to buy what they're putting up. But by that time, it's too late. The thing is gone. Because when you begin to march, you are now breaking the law. Congress has already passed a law saying this area is to be condemned and urbanized. So you are breaking the law. Because you, and you didn't intervene when the policy was being discussed. So we are always behind, not the eighth board. We behind about the 18th board. <laughs> We're always late because we don't understand policy, programs, and projects. And even those who understand it, one, are too scared to do anything about it, and the others are too involved with making a living to have the time to deal with it. You don't have the time. You can't deal with that. You're catching hell just living from day to day. How, how are you going to take time out to deal with that? You can't take time out to deal with that. That is why we have to have organizations that act on your behalf. Individuals do not have the time. The average individual doesn't have the time and the resources to deal with this. But somebody has to deal with it. Somebody has to understand. But what you can do, you can understand it. So that when the NACP is acting, you must understand whether they're doing the right thing or not. And you must know, therefore, that you support them to the best of your ability. If, for example, the objective 
is that no longer in education, that no longer will the children of the poor be educated, they'll only be trained. Right? When that policy is being made, you better intervene because they want to do a lot of things like they're doing here, giving you five thousand dollars for a voucher, so you can go to school with the same at the Kennedys. They're not telling you that the damn thing costs fifteen thousand. They're giving you five thousand. Where you going to get the other ten thousand? And what is more, for every five thousand that they give out, that amount is subtracted from the DC budget for education. So instead of having, instead of giving DC more money to bring the schools up to par, they are taking away money and guaranteeing that within five to ten years there will be no public school because we are in the process of abolishing the public school education. But you don't know that because five thousand sounds like so much money that you're grabbing it. I said, boy, my child is going to the school, school, with the, with the Kennedys. But what is going to happen 10 years from now when there are no public schools? The policy must be to improve the public schools, not to abolish them. I see every day I wake up, I say, eight more schools to be closed. <coughs> and I just smile and go, we told people that long ago. We are in the process of abolishing public education for all. Sooner or later, you will come to understand it. But that is what we did it in, in Virginia years ago. When, in 1954, we, we did that. When the Supreme Court said we had to integrate, we said, hell no, but yes, hell no. They closed the goddamn schools, gave everybody $1,000 to go to a private school, and didn't tell them it cost $3,000. And in those days, there was no way poor people could vote and raise the additional two thousand dollars. You understand? So for three years, poor blacks never went to school in Virginia. That's history. All right. Now, <clears throat> that is planning at that level. So you have objectives, strategy, and tactics. On the action side, you have policy programs and projects. Objectives, objectives give rise to, to policy. Strategy gives rise to programs. Tactics give rise to projects. Policies predetermine. Policy predetermines pr programs and programs predetermine projects. By the time it gets down to, to projects, the deal has already been done. But most of us will never function at the level of national, regional, or global planning. The U.S. government functions at the level, not of regional, of national, regional, and global planning. And by region, I don't mean region of the United States. I mean region of the world. <coughs> Now, our thing, planning, that we are going to encounter on a day-to-day -day basis is usually at the level of tactics. That is to say, I want, I want to start a program for the children in my neighborhood because something is wrong. I'm not quite sure what it is but they're not learning as they should learn. They're not getting the kind of education they should get. Or you want to start a project in housing, right? That is not policy. Somebody has already made the policy. Within that, you have just decided you want to help your neighborhood. No, let's move to that level of planning, because that is also important because one has to start somewhere. And it is not true a change always comes from the top. Sometimes the most profound change starts at the bottom. 
Let me just tell you a, a true story so you appreciate what I'm about to say. In the 60s, a group got together and wanted to undertake project on housing for the poor. And the, the DC government, with the aid of the federal government, gave a $5 million contract to a company to build housing units, affordable housing units for the poor. Well, the man went in to build, started talking to the people in the community. They didn't agree with what he was trying to do. So whereas he had promised to start building within six months, it took about three years before the project even started. He had spent a lot of money in the time in community meetings, feeding people with cookie and cool aid, trying to get them to agree with him, you know? So by the time he got around to building, I don't know what the facts are, but I know he built 10 units, $5 million in those days, eh? That was a lot of money. He built about 10 units. I mean, and he stopped. And the government of DC and all of them said, but what happened? In those days, you would get a nice house for $12,000. $14,000 was a fabulous house. You built 10 units. He said, yeah. And he brought the contract that they had signed. The contract didn't say within what time frame it was to be built. And the contract didn't say how many units were to be built. It only said you must build some affordable units for the poor. He says 10 is plural. One is singular, 10 is plural. One is a unit. Ten are units. You asked me to build units, I have built ten units. And he took the case to court and won. Mm -hmm. There's another man down here, around here, who is still around, came very wealthy, by, bar by borrowing five million dollars from the government, with agreement to pay it back. <coughs> And, and he went and offered, the secretary was typing, that if you just put the word, you will not pay. The agreement said, you, you will pay, all right? And he said, he said, no, that was a mistake. It, it is supposed to read, you will not pay. And if you do that, I give you a unit. And she did, because she wanted a unit. And when the time came, went to pay back the money, and the government wrote to him, he brought the contract and said, no, my contract said I will not pay. And he didn't pay the end. And he's now a multimillionaire. See, those are the games that get played. So we have learned from those games. <laughs> and so now, first thing when you're planning is what we call problem identification. so many problems that no one person or one organization can solve all of these problems, particularly at the local community level. So if you begin, if you if you are serious in an organization, in your community, you have to say, what problem am I going to tackle? Let us say 
housing for the argument's sake. You said there is a housing problem in my neighborhood. To tell me there's a housing problem doesn't tell me very much. And I'm giving you no money for that. <coughs> You have to define the problem. And so that comes to problem definition. Have these from the bleak and root is this this. That the people, that the house is too small, the average family is six, and the house was only built for three. You understand? Right. So you have to go down, problem definition, A. B, C, all the way down, and identify very clearly what is the problem. Because when I decide to write the contract, I have to be very specific and say, you will have to do, build 1,000 units of this size of this quality, of this size, and I can't write that if you have not identified the problem clearly. Because when the time comes to evaluate project, I have to have a number. If you set out to build a thousand units, and you only build 500, and you only going to get half the money. Right? If you, put, if you set out to build a unit that can house five, six people, and you have only built a unit that can house three people, I am paying you. You have not fulfilled contract. You understand? All right. So when you come in, you have to one, having said there's a housing problem, you can't just go, say, there's a housing problem, I want some money. You don't work like that. <laughs> you have to specify in detail and define the problem in detail. Because that means you then have an objective criteria by which you can decide if the problem has been met. Has it been met 50%? Has it been met 60%? Has it been met 80%? But if you don't have specifics, you don't have any means of measuring. You can't measure outcomes if you don't have specifics. Which means you have to go do some work and first convince me that there is a housing problem and two, define for me what is the housing problem. What are the details? of the housing problem. Which means you have to go and start what? Data collection. You have to go and collect data. Right? That involves data collection. For all of this, your word means nothing. We're doing business now. Your word means nothing. You have to produce objective data in support of what you are saying. After we have done that, in your organization, you're still in your organization, you don't come to me for any money yet, you know. You don't come to me for money yet. You're still in your organization deciding you want to prepare a proposal. You have to bring people together, right, to ask them for what, what we call solution suggestion. Because everybody in your community will have an idea of how it should be done. 
And if you don't include them, they'll have to burn it down with burn your building. So you have to include them. And when you include them and they come to the meeting, you can't tell them, you're talking foolishness, I don't want to hear that. Whatever they say, you have to write it down. You have to accept it. You write it down. Because they must understand that they have a voice and that you're listening to them and you're respecting their views. You have to listen to the suggestions of all the parties that are going to be affected by this. After you've gotten all those suggestions, then is the way we, you usually do it. Let us say you have 15 people in this room. You break up into groups of five, three groups of five. And we say to one group, you deal with matters involving money. All the suggestions that have been made about money, you deal with that. Pick them up. All the suggestions that have been made about location, size, group two deal with that. The other group deal with technical things. What kind of materials you're going to use. And what you'll find, when you go and begin to group the suggestion, they do fall into groups. And as you go through, you're going to find that a lot of these suggestions are really the same things stated in different ways. Right? So out of that process comes Solution selection. So we started out with maybe a hundred <coughs> suggestions. We say to each group, condense it into five. Put, you know, you can put them, you can eliminate some, throw some out, accept some of them, or combine. But what are the five critical recommendations that have been made? <coughs> and that is solution selection. All of this, we are still at the level of what? Data collection. still in the process of the collection. After we select a solution, a group agrees, this is what we want. So your proposal now says, therefore we propose these 15 things. This is the, these are the 15 things that we want. Now here's where the problem comes. But in a very large number of our organizations and groups, once we get to solution selection, we are so tired and we are so happy, we go home and we celebrate. <laughs> right? And I'll tell you a story which is a true story. When we had the Poor People's March on Washington, Reverend Abernathy, as you know, was in charge. And for some reason, the thing was not well organized. And we knew that the government was coming to throw the people out of the camp that we had done there. So we went to Abernathy and we said to him, Tomorrow morning, the government is sending in troops to move the people out of the camp. What are you going to do? What are we going to do about it? And this is what I'm telling you: it's facts. Eh? 
And Abu Nadir said, that's not a problem, because we have 500 young white people from New England, from New York, who wanted to come, but I stopped them, I stopped them in New Jersey. And they're there waiting for me to call them whenever I need them. So what we're going to do tonight, we're going to call those 500 young whites, because police ain't going to shoot down white people. So we're going to call these 500 young white students, and we're going to circle the camp with these 500 white students. And when the police come, they won't be able to get into the camp because the only way they can is to shoot them. So people said, well, that sounds good. And we left. And in those days, we had a hotel up the street, or 14th Street there, about up there by uh, the Belmont. Where Jan 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 Pits Motel. Pits Motel. And that's where it happened out here in the group was staying at Pits Hotel. So that morning, I woke up at 5 o'clock. And I said to myself, but Leo, you are, are a fool. What makes you think that the right thing is going to happen when it hasn't happened in three weeks? So I ran to my TV, turned it on, and the police were inside the camp hmm. at 5 o'clock in the morning. Military input were inside the camp. So I jumped up and got dressed. We ran down to pits, woke up Abenaki. We said, what happened? He said, boy, we came and we are so pleased with the solution that we had selected. We party all night and forgot to make a call. We, we did nobody made a call. <laughs> All that was needed was to make a telephone call. Nobody was assigned to make the telephone call. <laughs> this is not this is not a joke, eh? I'm not making this up. This actually happened. All right. And well, I, look, I, I have seen this happen so often that when we get to the point where we select a solution, we are so elated and so happy, we celebrate for the next two weeks. After Martin, we celebrated for 10 years. <laughs> and all the time we were celebrating, the people were planning how to take it back. Mm -hmm. And we are still celebrating. See? So after you get the solution selection, the critical one is an action plan. You have to come up with an action plan. <coughs> and the action plan is we have to say, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? When are we going to do it? And who is responsible for doing what? Those things have to be clearly stated and agreed upon. But we don't bother with that. That is too much work. <coughs> you understand? So, that is why very often when I lecture, before I get half it should be like, okay, tell us now what, what we should do. No, I ain't telling you that. No, I ain't telling you that. I'm giving you the data. You figure out what to do. Do some work. No, you want to be spoon fed. You want everybody to tell you what you should go out and do. You are, in, you are intelligent people. If you have it, the life is about problem solving. Anybody in this room who has a job, you have a job because somebody has decided that you have the knowledge and or skills to solve a problem. Even if, if you're just going to mow somebody's lawn, Somebody has decided that you're strong enough to
to push the damn lawn more and more. The Lord, otherwise I wouldn't employ you. Life is about problem solving. You cannot escape that. And so problem solving means you have to do some physical work and you have to do some intellectual work. Nothing is going to be handed to you on a platter. And when you are in every audit, I know, if you have 20 people, 100 people in the organization, 70 of them are talkers, mm -hmm. and you're lucky like hell if you have 20 workers. Every organization has more talkers than they have workers. Now you have to decide what you want to be, a talker or a worker. Because we don't need talkers. We, we have that. Oh God, we can talk. <laughs> Go to church on a Sunday morning, <laughs> and you see, see. If we want to change things, talking don't do it. Work is what does it. So we better understand the problem, because you can't solve the problem if you don't understand it. You have to understand the problem. You have to figure out what is the solution to the problem. That is what education is all about. Education is about acquiring the knowledge and skills that are required for problem solving. That's what education is about. Acquiring the knowledge and skills that are required for problem solving. But since no one human being can solve all problems, you decide, of all the problems in the world, I want to solve this one. Whatever, if you want to be a carpenter, a plumber, a mechanic, a doctor, a dentist, a street sweeper, whatever it is you want to do. But do it well and acquire the knowledge and skills that are required to do that thing. And then do it. Don't just talk about it. We have people who come to meetings, the ones who do the least talk the most at every meeting. And from the time the meeting is over and they walk through the door, they don't give another thought to anything that has been said until the next meeting. And as soon as they arrive, they start talking again. And then tell you, we ought to do. And what are they telling you? We ought to do. The same thing that we agreed on three months ago and that they were assigned to do and they haven't done. So am I telling you the truth? We have all been through it. Uh, now that you, you're wasting your time and you're wasting people's time. We don't need that exercise. We don't need that. So this is it. You have to identify the problem. You have to define the problem in detail. You have to come up with a solution suggestions, you have to come with solution, selection, but then the work starts. <coughs> the work is the action plan. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? Within what time frame? And who is responsible for doing what? So that people must be held accountable. Just to walk out and say, the group decided. This is what that everybody does. The group has decided, we will do. Who the hell is the group? If you talk about the group has decided, it means that no decision has been made. The group has, if the group has decided, you must have specified a person or persons who are responsible for specific tasks. Until you have done that, you haven't done anything. Okay. So, that's where we are. With planning. <laughs> now, I just want to add one more thing. I'm going to stop. I'm going to ask any question you want.
because Yeah, yeah, sure. No, 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 this is all going to take five minutes. And then we're going to go. Right? Now, after the group has come up, written, you have now written a proposal for housing. You've done all of that. You get the money. Now you have to implement it. You've gotten the money now. If you've gotten the money to implement the project, you need some management. Mm. Mm? You don't finish yet, you know. Somebody has to manage a project. Now, again, everybody thinks that they have a manager. Let me just summarize for you. Management means listen, the efficient and effective utilization of one, space. Two, time. Three, human resources. Four, material resources. And five, financial resources. Right? And as you know, many a project has failed because of incompetent management. Because if you have incompetent management with respect to the utilization of space, with respect to the utilization of time, with respect to human resources, material resources, or financial resources, the project is going to fail. Let's take a simple one that people don't think about time. You have an appointment with somebody and they say to you, I'm very busy, I can give you half an hour. Come and see me at 10.30. And you get there at 10.50. Hmm? If that appointment is with another efficient manager, he will not see you at 10.50. He will not see you at 10.50. He told you, come and see me at 10.30 and I have half an hour to give you. You don't arrive at 10 minutes to 11. You arrive at 10.30. That's why in psychiatry and in psychological counseling, we, 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 the, 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 the psychiatric hour is 50 minutes. Because the psychiatrist has to spend five minutes after you leave writing up your file and he spends five minutes reviewing the file of the incoming patient. Right? So the psychiatric hour is 50 minutes. Part of the problem who need people who need psychiatric care is that they are not disciplined. And the first thing you have to break them out of is indiscipline. So if you tell them to come at 11, 
and they come at 20 past 11, you turn them away and you charge them. Because mm -hmm. if you turn them away and don't charge them, they'll keep mm -hmm. doing it. The other thing in psychiatric counseling, and we always ask, where do you work, what do you do? So we want to get an idea of your income, you know, what you can afford to pay. And we always charge just a little bit more than you can afford to pay. Because in psychiatric counseling and counseling, the client gets attached to the counselor because you're helping to solve their problem and you are beginning to look important. And if they get attached to you, they want to keep coming. And if you charge them what they cannot afford without any effort, they never stop coming. <coughs> they never stop coming. So you always charge just a more than they can afford. So they say, oh God, this is pinching me. I can't afford it. And then they begin to get better because they begin to act. Otherwise, they develop a dependency syndrome, right? Where I don't, they don't do what you tell them. They make no effort to solve problems for themselves because they want to be dependent on the psychologist or the psych psychiatrist. That is why those psych Psychiatrists who want to make a lot of money run out to Hollywood. Because what they can charge the people in Hollywood, they can't charge you and me. But we ain't going to psychiatrists any damn now. <laughs> right? So we can't afford it. But, but you go to Hollywood, and what those people are charged is about 10 times what the average person is charged. It is not theft. It is not theft. It is that if you charge them what you charge a normal client, oh, them Hollywood people, every day you go, they, they'll be sitting up in there. Because for them, a thousand dollars don't mean anything. So you have to charge them ten thousand dollars of this. <laughs> you understand? Uh, no. Let's come at, take a simple thing like human resources. We have some managers who operate like this. I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. We, we, three days from now, come back here and report and then walk out of the room. And when you come back, if you haven't done it, you're fired. You did it, you stay. You, you didn't do it, you're fired. You, you did it and you did it well, I, I'll give you a promotion. And they're gone. That is not management. That is not management. Different human beings require different amounts of supervision. Some people require a small amount of supervision. Some require a medium amount of supervision. Some require a lot of supervision. And some require no supervision. The manager must make an assessment of each and every employee and know what the capabilities and propensities of each employee is and you supervise according to that decision. If a person is a self-starter and does not need supervision, and you keep supervising them, you bug the hell out of them <laughs> and they will leave you. Right? Mm -hmm. If the person needs a lot of supervision, and you provide them no supervision, they're going to leave, because they are functioning above their capacity. They are not getting any help. People function best when they function 
at the level of your intellectual and psychological comfort. You know, human beings function best when they function at the level of intellectual and psychological comfort. The responsibility of the manager is to make a correct and proper evaluation about the intellectual and psychological requirements of each person and to, and to supervise accordingly. So that is why you hear people will tell you, the job pays well, but I can't deal with that. I leave it. Right? Then, particularly for us, where our organizations are voluntary, and we can't pay people any damn harm, how the hell are you going to fire somebody who we never employed? And I go into community organizations, and the president is telling me, well, you know, these people are not dependable. I'm going to fire the whole I said, I said, no, no, the law says the person is your employee after they have signed a contract specifying precise tasks, hours of work, and pay. You have to do all three <laughs> before you become an employee. If you sign a contract saying what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, and how you put there ain't no money, you're not an employee. You're a volunteer. <laughs> you're a volunteer. You can't fire a volunteer. You can ask them not to come back. <laughs> but you, you can't fire them. You ain't paying them. In a voluntary organization, therefore, the manager must have tremendous motivational skills. You have to be able to motivate people to do what needs to be done because they, are, they have a commitment and a belief in what you are doing. So this idea of coming in and just giving up, you will do this, you will do this, you will do this, and report back to me in five days. You don't call during the week to say, well, how are you doing? For the person who needs to, if you call say, how are you doing? But if you have enough problem, let me know, but I'll help you. Hmm? For the person who doesn't need it, fine, no problem, no problem, right? So after you've done your action plan, you get the money, you get the proposal, you better sure, be clear, that your management and supervisors have some management and supervisory skills. That is to say, the efficient and effective utilization of space, time, human resources, material resources, and financial resources. Because many an organization has gone down because somebody messed up with, with the money and maybe did it accidentally. Hmm? Or, or messed up on any one of those. No, I'm stopping now. I'm okay. So that you I was going to stop you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do this. Let's do this. Before commentary, I know some of us have comments to make about few of, you know, some of the issues. I would prefer the first part of our interaction with him should be based on questions. Because there's some, some, you know, some points that we want uh, to maybe amplify. Uh, I think the macro, uh, you know, the concept of the macro, and what was the other one? Micro. 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 Micro and what? The, the intermediate. Intermediate, yeah. Intermediate. Yeah, good. That part. If you have a question on that, because the camera missed it uh, when we started, so it's, it's no problem if we can go over it. But let's go with question and answer. Any kind of question. I'm not telling you what to ask, really. But it should be a question. Go ahead. Brother, brother, brother Leo, based on um, all of your experiences over the years, which I assume brought a great deal of disappointment. Where are you right now in terms of our potential as a people? And, and how would you suggest that we move forward 
the next I'm 25 years. Okay. <laughs> I, I am an optimist. Okay, good. If you're not an optimist, you give up. Mm -hmm. But the point is, you, when you're an optimist, you also have to be a realist. And as somebody said, the longest journey belongs begins with a single step. Now people keep telling me we can't do it because it's going to take too long. But 30 years later they're still telling me that. If that started 30 years before, we will be well on the road now. You understand? Mm -hmm. right. You don't measure things. It is not, you don't have always, if you're an optimist, you don't measure things by your proximity to your goal. You measure it from the distance that you have traveled. If you have a, score, a goal of minus 10 to plus 10, and if you're starting from minus 5, and you move from minus 5 to 0, that is a hell of a movement. And you must celebrate that. The goal is to get to plus 10. But don't say, because I'm at zero, I ain't doing nothing. Because you, if you have moved from minus five to zero, you are on your way. You keep on going. We, it has taken us a long time to get to zero. But after we got to zero, Martin took us over into the positive axis. <coughs> and we've been moving. We ain't gotten to the finish line. But don't tell me that because you're not at the finish line, you're going to stop working. The, the essence of life is problem solving. And every day when you wake up, the only certainty you have in life, other than debt and paying taxes, is that you won't encounter problems during the, that day. I don't care who you are you are going to encounter problems during each and every day of your life. And you have to be equipped and ready to face up to and solve those problems. Right. Now, some of it has been rough. And so, when we come through, we tell people, <coughs> I forgot to tell you, I should tell you. One thing, never permit yourself to get to your breaking point. Every human being has a breaking point. The only person who knows your breaking point is you. Nobody else knows your breaking point. You know it. And you know when you are approaching your breaking point. But don't be macho and say, I'm a man. And because I'm a man, I can't let people know I'm approaching my breaking point. Because listen, when you it is takes a long time to break the first time. The second break comes much quicker than the first break, and the third break comes much quicker than the second break. It is like having a sore and with a scalp. And if before it heals you that you get that scalp, it takes a longer time. Right? So, when you find yourself getting to the breaking point, humor is one of the things that save us. When things get really rough and you feel like you're getting ready to kill somebody, you turn it into a joke and you laugh. And when you laugh, you get rid of the internal tension. The, the other person, if the other person ever laughed too, the, the game is won because the other person means the other person is coming down also. Because if when things get rough, you get nasty, <coughs> the other person will get nasty. And then it becomes a game of who can get nastier. And the next thing you know, you're into a fight. And nowadays, people walk with guns, not just knife, you know. They don't only carry knife, they carry gun too. Right? So when it gets to that point, you have to calm things down. And one of the ways to calm things down, that's why we have so many black comedians. Wendy Gregory <coughs> used to lecture seriously. Dick Gregory couldn't make any money. <coughs> I 
And then Big Gregory said, listen, you know, these people want to kill me, they want to put me in jail. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell them the same thing, but I'm going to tell it to them in a humorous way. And Big Gregory started to say the same thing in a humorous way, and he became a millionaire. You understand? Because people laugh. As you, if you make people laugh, they don't get upset. You understand? You have to develop all kinds of survival techniques. And we have done it. So I have told you before that one thing that we know that we have done is that when we are very angry, we smile. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. When you want to kill somebody, sister, you, you're so nice. Thank you so much. And all the time, boy, you boy, and you have to run on quickly and do all kinds of things. But that is not just true of the poor, eh? Middle class and upper class, that's why we have clubs. Because after you've worked all day and you're stressed, and you don't want to, and you, walk, you don't want to arrive at the door, and the wife meets you telling you, the children have been giving me all trouble, all day. please come in and take care. You don't want to hear that, right? So you stop at the club, you play some tennis, you play some cricket, you play some football, you play golf, you do whatever. You sit down, you have a couple of drinks, and when you come now, you go home now, and when the wife Approach you at the door that I said, honey, let's have a drink together. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry to tell me the problem. <laughs> now, let's sit down and have a drink together. But if you haven't calmed yourself down, you went to you say, what the hell you you and then she gets upset now. You understand? And that is why mothers have way of when the children do anything during the day, instead of punishing them. Wait until your father comes. <laughs> hmm? In other words, you're the bad fellow. Mm -hmm. You understand? They don't punish because they want the love of their children. And they want their children to love them. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to punish their children. Because the children must not say, Mommy, punish me. So you are a bad boy. You did. You know you should. But I'm not, wait until your father comes. <laughs> and as soon as you hit the door, they start saying, your, your son is not our son anymore, you know. <laughs> your son did so and so. Punish him. Hmm? But we have we, we, we've been through that. We know how to deal with that. So we keep on going. That is why we're still alive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Looking at all this information that you've given us and you've kindly gone through it, what from like the collective to the individual, like back and forth. Yeah. Is it kind of safe to say that if we think about personal lives as a system, yeah. that each thing that you gave us that would free us or help us on a collective level, all those things can also be done on an individual level and vice versa? No, but a society is nothing more than a collection of individuals. And the society is as effective as the individuals are. All of these things have to be within the individual, but you pool it, and when you pool it, the society becomes very strong. Because but if you have individuals who are pulling up, if you believe this, and I believe that, and, he, and we're pulling against each other, then you have a non-effective society. But where, if you want to get work done, you, try, you, that you have to get people who want to subscribe to a set of beliefs, of general beliefs, to which they all subscribe. Otherwise, you spend a lot of time fighting each other. But the success of the group is going to depend on the contribution of the individuals. <coughs> but the individuals have to control their egos so that they are about promoting the interest of the group, not grandstanding to prove how bright I am. We have a lot of eye doctors in this world. <laughs> Tremendous amount of eye doctors. Always telling about, I did this, I said so. I, and the only words they know is I, me, mine, and myself. They, they never say we, they don't say us, they don't say our. 
<laughs> right? It is always I. Now, anytime you hear that, get them out of the group. They're dangerous. <laughs> you don't need any eye doctors in the group if you're about to do serious work. You, it is a matter of coming together. Each person has different skills. But it is a matter of pooling so that this, the group is very strong. Right? That is what we're talking about. And that's why we have to deal with the personal. Because it begins with the personal. But if each person says, I'm an island unto myself, then you never have a group. It has to be, I be but we all subscribe to a common set of principles. And we are all going to work towards the achievement of these principles. We will do it in different ways. We make different contributions in different amounts, but the totality is moving us towards the achievement of these principles. So when you start on it, that's why I, I said, we cannot come in the room and just start talking about Pan-Africanism. Because everybody will have a totally different concept of what Pan-Africanism is, what it was, why it didn't fail, why it didn't succeed, we have to understand, we all have to start with a common database. We all, all have to move, we're moving towards a common goal. Anytime a chain is as weak as its weakest link. So let me just check that and, and stop. Um, Leo, I want to get to the question of, of, of macroeconomics. Yeah. And I want to deal with the period 1960 to 1970 in our struggle. Because our struggle in that period was defined as a struggle for civil rights, for freedom, for even human rights, as Malcolm himself suggested at some point in time, but was a struggle that was immersed in a political vision they never developed among us, those of us in, at the time, a macroeconomic approach to the problems of black people. Uh, and at times, one could even suggest that in Africa, where Krumah says, give us the political vision or the political um, kingdom, give us the political kingdom, and all, all other things will be added on to it which means that there is no macroeconomic macro approach to the problem of the journey from independence to sovereignty in, in the whole journey of freedom. All right? Now, if that is the case, and we don't, I'm going back now to getting rid of these, um, these people, the, the, the program that you were talking about, managers. If that is the case, even in local areas, in, 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 in Southwest or in DC, the people that are trained are still not trained to have a macro approach to the problem. So they, they have individual suggestions of education here and health over there and somebody else. And even the mayors don't have, or the, or the people who are in charge don't have that last set. How do we correct that? Or is that a problem that we face where we have not produced people or engaged in a dialogue on questions of macroeconomics to help us to see a larger scope of things um, with regard to, and we haven't developed the infrastructure for resolving those, those larger problems. And did that, did that remain the weakness from 1970 to the present in our not only struggle here in the United States, but our struggle in the Pan-African world? Well, that was not our problem from the 60s to 70s. That was a problem from they brought us here until now. Okay. It hasn't happened. And during the time when we have not been doing it, they have been doing it. And without going through the long thing, listen, let, let, let me just tell you quickly. When <coughs> America won the war of independence from the British, King George III tried to take back on the economic field what he had lost in the field of battle. He then offered the new United States a free trade agreement because the 
England was the biggest and most powerful economy at the time. And these newly won colonies could not <coughs> possibly compete with England. Had they bought it into that, they would within five years have become recolonized. It was Alexander Hamilton who said, hell no, we're not going to do that. And Alexander Hamilton submitted three proposals to, to, to Congress. One on manufacturers, one on credit, and one on a national bank. They were all approved, together with a number of other nationalist economies. He created something called the American System of Political Economy. The big boys didn't like that. So they fought against it. And that is what took America down in 29. Roosevelt came in and he reintroduced it. No sooner than Roosevelt died, the big boys took over again. Right? And did away with the American system of political economy. The American system of political had nothing to do with the free trade. The American system accepts the concept of markets, but not free markets. The American system of political economy says that all markets are imperfect. And the extent to which markets are controlled, it depends on the degree of the imperfection. A market is controlled to the extent that it is imperfect. There, you cannot find any economic textbook that talks about free market. There's no such thing as a free market. Right. Now, <clears throat> they took over and they reintroduced another system in which it says, and Milton Friedman did this, <coughs> wrote a book of monetarist theory. And monetarist theory says the ultimate goal of economics is the accumulation of money. That was never, never has been the goal of economics, the accumulation of money. Money was intended merely as a means of exchange. Ec the economy is about how to increase productivity. So that, for example, if you have an acre of land and only your wife and yourself, with a little bit of labor, you can produce enough food for the two of you. But if you have four children, that amount of food ain't going to be enough. How do you increase productivity to take care of four people? Right? Science and technology comes in, into that, and we're not going into detail. But at different times, the means of exchange has been stone, iron, copper. Right? It's only recently it became paper money. Now, he writes a thing saying, that the ultimate objective of economics is the accumulation of wealth, meaning money. And he won the Nobel Prize for that. And so everybody accepted it. Then there came two economists behind him who went further. And they wrote books saying, <coughs> calling it the application of gains theory to economics. Now, gains theory is about gambling. Economics is not about gambling. But we have embraced that, and we call that the post-industrial system, where, where the art of, of economics right, is wealth creation, meaning financial speculation. All right. So if you, we don't have time to do it, but if, if you did, if you do the technical thing, you will see that the financial aggregates of the United States and the world have gone through the roof. <coughs> but the physical economy has gone through the floor. Now, the, uh, the, the finance money is only as valuable as that which supports it. Right? So if the financial <coughs> aggregates are going through the roof. Physical economy is going through the floor. What you're doing, you're creating a bubble. 
and every bubble must eventually burst. That is what is happening globally right now. And they can't stop it because the amount of fictitious money that they have created, all this money that they claim, they don't have any. And none of them can, every bank in America is bankrupt. It, it, they have it only on paper. They have nothing to, if Europe, if Asia and the Middle East stop investing in America, the American economy would collapse in six months. Uh, no, it is, that is what is what's going on. Uh, so all these ga games are games, but we buy into everything because we don't, our black schools, instead of teaching black people this, teaching them the, their, this nonsense about monetary theory and financial speculation. So when we talk about economic development, we are talking about what they say. The, the, the same thing happens. We, and, and, and in black communities where I go, and people say, it is time for us to turn to the economic. And I say, what kind of economics are you talking about? <laughs> They're talking about getting rich quick. Getting rich quick is about financial speculation. You understand? Oh, no. So, one of the problems that we have, and this is the fifth problem in Africa, because the African Union now was proposed by Gaddafi. Well, if you know that, the African Union used to be the OAU. The African, the African Union was put proposed by Gaddafi, who said we must develop a model based on self-reliance. We must use the resources of Africa to develop. Well, the, the West got frightened and they ran. Oh. And they got Nigeria and five of them, all these models which are doing that, to say, no, we want the Western model. And to prove that the Western model is the right one, they came up with a thing called NEPA. Hmm? in which Bill Gates put up $50 million, Rio Tinto put up $50 million, billion, I mean, right? But all the major companies of the world put up the money. They created a board on which Africans have the majority, but they have a finance committee on which all these money people sit. So while the Africans are in the majority and they can vote for any goddamn thing they want, it has to be approved by the Finance Committee. And if the Finance Committee don't approve it, it can't get done. So South Africa, which we thought by now would be moving, ain't going no damn where because they are caught up in Nepal. <laughs> you understand? Right. So just to say, that we are going to, on the economic, you better be careful what economics you're talking about. So, actually, uh, we're in there. We, do you know it, how we tried to do it? Yes. And they told us no, it we wouldn't be done. They won't even allow you to teach courses on political we, economy. We, we had, listen, with no political economy. We, we had a head of the Department of Economics who tried to do it. Yeah. And Cheek, again, yeah. went to him, called him in, and said, listen, you have, and, and his book, he still had, had, had that book, The Economic of Black, The Economics of Black Development. And she went to him and said, you're doing outstanding work. I want you to take leave as chairman and continue this research that you, because Nixon had told him to get him, to get, the name was Davis. Nixon had told him to, 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 get, to get Davis out, right? He employed a young man who, wasn't even at the level of a professor, on the way up, made him chairman of the department. And when Davis realized what I mean, just like the head of political science, he became an alcoholic. He started walking across the, the campus <coughs> because he had been tricked. Because he was about to do serious work. And the president of Howard said, no, when we tried to take over Adams Morgan, Adams Morgan as a model to show them how it could be done, 
She called us in and said, no, you can't do that. We said, why? He said, because if you do that, at some point, you're going to come into a policy conflict with the federal government. We said, well, that is what a university is all about. He says, no, not at this university. Yes. We don't come into any policy conflict with the federal government. What year was this? Eh? What year? This is 70s. President Cheek's time. This was 72, 74. Because, because Adams Morgan was black, Hispanic, and everything at that time. Yeah. I used to live out over there. Yeah. We were trying to organize it. Eh? Everything. The dancers, what they call them, who is over in, in Southeast. They danced out. Huh? So <laughs> they, they got rid of everybody under so there. They were transforming that area. Georgetown moved in. Oh, yes. open Georgetown. Yeah. Georgetown. No yeah. room. Yeah. 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 We, could have we were organizing, we were working night and day around the clock. We were offered, so they, they asked us to come and do it. She said, no, oh, yeah. you, you can have conferences. But who, is the you, community asked you or who asked Yes, the community. community? Yeah. And they said, no, you can She said, no, you, you can have conferences, you can publish papers and write books, every, have a big conference every year, publish the proceedings, but don't do it. <laughs> Talk about it, but don't do it. You understand? All right. So that is where we are. So that is why we have been going through this thing. Because it ain't easy. And that's the only I keep saying it's not easy. Because when you don't have anything and someone is telling you you can make some quick money, the temptation is great. And the bribes used to be in the old days a five thousand dollar or ten thousand was a massive bribe. No, they, they ain't got no problem offering you 500,000 or a million because the damn thing ain't got no value. <laughs> it doesn't like, uh, 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 you know, it's like somebody write me a ch check and say, Leo Edwards is now a millionaire. <laughs> no, if I stick it up on my wall, I'm all, but if I go to a bed, I start, I don't, but start spending it. As if I really have a million. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Yes, this fictitious money that is floating around is exists only on paper. It does not exist in actuality. Right? All right. Now, so if we are simply going to go and start practicing and teaching Friedman monetary theory, or that or the application of game theory to economics, then, you know, it is a waste of time. But those are the people who have been given the Nobel Prize for economics, and therefore the world says they are the greatest, and we are being told that is what we must do. How many people, and if you don't do that, bam, they come at you with total warfare. No, that is it, you know. Be. Mm. Now that is what we don't know. Most of us know what we are against, but we don't know what we are for. You have to know what you are for. The difference between what is and what ought to be is an accurate measure of the amount of work that needs mm -hmm. to be done. But like in a case like this, where the gap between what is and what is very large, people get discouraged. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you have to be careful how you talk to people. But the first thing we have to do, what we are going through here, we are getting you to understand what is. Because you cannot change it if you don't understand it. You have to know what is. <coughs> then we have to talk about what ought to be. And then we have to, how do we get from what is to what ought to be? But we don't get that by, lo by, by losing hope. But, you know, there I would like you to really look at, don't you, I mean, you are implying that implicitly. But I think to me it's like filmmakers cannot tell the truth, artists cannot, art, artists who should tell the truth are now collaborating uh, for whatever individual reasons. Uh, because uh, the the community uh, or the masses who consume your expressions uh, need to be uplifted. That's that's capitalist propaganda, from my view. Now, I thought for me, what makes 
uh, facing squarely the depressing, let's, say, let's even call it since depressing to know the facts, to know what is. To know what is, if it is depressing, to me, what makes it not depressing is the resistance against it to invade the new world. So to me, these are like the, the snake, the poison, the medicine of this depression. To me, I think we should not be afraid uh, now to be depressed because that's what I think is the, the necessary uh, confrontation with inventing the future. Now, if somebody only didn't have alternative vision, then we have, so you would say what is, and then what is, oh, to what, yes, those are the dialectics, and I, to me, otherwise, we're that going to create makes a, life interesting. Thank you. Otherwise, we're going to get a psychologically completely disoriented people that will never wake up. That's right. You know, because at least now, if the passion, the goal inspires us, and this is my understanding, this is where I take it, if not, I, you know, to me, what is pushes me what it should be. My role to be active in that drama, my own self-involvement gives me the inspiration. Therefore, there is no depression. So to me, I think black people are using this trick of like, uh, do not tell me the truth. Uh, like what, you want to not want to know the truth, then you don't want to change the, the world. But I think, the, you know, so this is what I, I am encouraged by, is the fact that you give us know what is if you want, you know, and then know what you want if you want. That, those are the two dialectical points that I think makes me be very encouraged. You know, that, as far that, as I'm that is what is called progress, moving from what is to what ought to be. So don't get depressed about it. What it provides is with an opportunity to create change. <coughs> now, I have a question for you now. <coughs> to me, if like, like you take President Cheek, you know, because I got his, his last reign when I got to Howard. If an individual, to me, I think we need to go more on the individual versus the collective and the weight of the collective if uh, they are to the sabotage and torpedo uh, vision of an individual. And how is that struggle weighted? Because at a certain point, for example, for me as a, in a filmmaking situation, at a certain point the filmmaker uh, cannot be weighed down by the collective deadbeats that come to destroy your vision. Now, how does that translate for the collective organization in terms of like, since we are heading for the Pan-African thing, how do you then, how do you uh, shade the collective death that might take the individual life out? Because you take, Chi comes in as an individual, but by a collective force, he comes to represent a collective force. And brings people like him. Like him. Now, I'm saying, that how is this thing, how is this negotiation when it comes to like, when the collective, you know, at a certain point becomes the enemy of the vision, the individual, what should the individual do? Let's say if it's not ego, but let's say if the individual felt his or her vision is being killed by the collective de death, what do you do? You wait for a time by going to a pupa stage of, Self-consciousness, or what do you do? No, 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 because let me tell you what happened, because we finally got rid of it. It took a while, but we finally got rid of it. But what it takes at that point, and that's why I talked to you earlier about psychological mind control. And the key to psychological mind control is your definition of success. That is the key to psychological mind control. Your, your definition of success. We are told in this not in this society, it is better to it, you want to go along in order to get along. You hear this all the time. See, when Clarence Thomas was running, we were told to have a black face is important, and once a black man is running, you must support him. Don't worry about what he's going to do. Just support him because he's black. So the man goes there and does what he's doing. What Chief did, well, and it was a very nice thing, he took a number of young people who had just gotten their PhDs. Some of them had never worked before anywhere. Others had worked for a maximum of one to two years, which meant they did not expect rise to the level of professor for another 10 years. He made them 
full professors right away and made, even made them heads of department with the corresponding salary. Now, as far as they are concerned, they had achieved. They were now successful. <coughs> but they had no administrative experience. They didn't know the history. They didn't know what we are talking about. But if you said anything against Cheek, they would hurt you. Because he had made them successful by paying them. And he kept increasing their salaries. Because they had accepted the definition of success as the acquisition of money, material things, and status. But there was a small group of people who said to hell with that. That is wrong. And if it is wrong, it is wrong. And so they stood up against it and eventually won. But it took a hell of a fight and a hell of sacrifice. Because what is happening, a lot of people who are even with us said, boy, you can go that way, but you know, my wife tells me she wants a bigger house. Hmm. My daughter tells me she wants a car. And if I go with you, I can't afford to buy a bigger house and a car. You see what I'm saying? Right. So your, what you, not what anybody tells you, what you define for yourself as success determines what you will, what action you will take. Some of us don't mind walking. In those days, some of us have to walk. But we said, no, no, we're not going along with something with just to get some more money. If this thing is not beneficial to us, we're not going to do it. No, you always have to have that group. Not the individual, because the individual by himself can be eliminated. You have to find a group of people who think like you, <coughs> educate them so that you can stand, so that when you are in trouble, you have at least somebody to call and say, boy, I'm in trouble. And you have the feeling that if something happens tomorrow, somebody will know about it. Because you cannot, as an individual, do it. But you have to create a group that understands and is willing to do some work towards the achievement of what ought to be, and is not insisting that I want to make money now, I want to be a millionaire by age 40 and retire, I want to have a $5 million house with four cars in the garage. But if that is their ambition in life, they will be with you. <laughs> no, and so that's why I said to you before, in, early in the game, that in this thing about psych behavior modification, we determine that it is, it's quite, it really is quite simple. If we get the world to accept the definition of success as the acquisition of money, material things, and status, we control the world. And that is what we. All this information warfare is about that. It's about getting the entire world to agree that success means the acquisition of money, material things, and status. Because if you do that, we control you. Yep. Any <laughs> other question from the floor? I have an observation in terms of when we take a serious look at Nkrumah in terms of Pan-Africanism, when we take a serious look at Nkrumah in terms of what Leo is saying, and we see Nkrumah coming into power, Nkrumah decides that he wants to move his money, the <coughs> Ghana's money, from the, 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 the bank. The, 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 the London Bank and bring it into Ghana so that they control their own money. Says on that. The person says no, because if we start with that, then there will be a call all around the world. In, in, in. We are prepared to give you independence. That's not the problem. The French said no. The, the, the country said we will not allow you to take your money out of our because we depend upon the use of that money. And at the same time, there's the problem of cocoa. 
He says, I want to move beyond the agricultural question and build a dam, the Volta project. And as he insists on building the dam, and as he <coughs> insists on a monetary policy that, that, that he envisions, it becomes obvious that Nkrumah has got to go. And, and then after that. Go ahead, take it from there. Let me just add this. Because you, have, you must all understand, Eisenhower announced a policy called Atoms for Peace. What? Atoms, Atoms for, for peace. peace. Where you could build nuclear weapon, I mean nuclear thing, to generate electricity. And it was a, a US proposal by Eisenhower, Atoms for Peace. And Plumer picked up on it mm -hmm. and submitted to the UN a proposal to build three nuclear plants, one in South, one in Central, one in North. And those three nuclear plants would have been capable of providing energy to all of Africa and therefore produce industrialization of Africa. But colonialism and imperialism required what they call the center periphery theory, where the colonies were to produce the raw materials, ship it to the metropole, they would do, and then ship it back to you. So that cocoa, you ship the raw cocoa to England, Cadbury makes Cadbury chocolate out of it, ship it back to you, they pay you a couple cents a pound for your cocoa. When the chocolate come back, it costs you a shilling, right? If Africa had been able to industrialize using that, Africa by now would be ahead of China. <coughs> that was when they said, no, 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 no. This thing, first you want to move your money. Then you want to build a dam. That is to say, you want to develop hydroelectric power. We stop you. Now you want to go nuclear. But the idea wasn't his, it was Eisenhower's. It was a formal proposal to the United Nations, the Atom for Peace proposal. Eisenhower said, if we can raise the standard of the world and move people out of part, the world will be a more peaceful place. And the way to do it was to provide the energy resource for, to industrialize. But the big corporations said, no, what are you talking about? We must control that, not Africans. But when Nkrumah said, Okay, I'm going to do it across Africa. That was the end of Enkroma. Now, they don't take, they then came with the whole heap of stories about Enkroma, of and which people believe. But that had nothing to do with what it had to do. Enkroma was about making Africa economically independent. No! They don't mind you having the appearance of political independence, but not economic independence. <laughs> and that, I think the thing you did under the table, you know, <laughs> that is so powerful. Because we, we just look at the surface. We don't know the under the table battle going on. Again, it's our visionaries. Lumumba, I was flashing all over Africa. And the African you know, diaspora, all our leaders, our dreamers, were really and then we join to undermine them because we have superficial. The, you know, we don't understand CNN's the information. Of what yeah, is. yeah. So yeah. we have to understand the reality of what is, and don't get depressed by it. You just <laughs> understand it. Or well, might as well get depressed, man. If you get depressed, you either kill yourself or be a revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe there's maybe a dip, I don't know. I'm not into you know. I think maybe depression. I mean, if we're afraid of it, we better go to deep depression, and we can come out towards a revolutionary. <laughs> well, well, unless you do, you're, you're prepared to be a suicide bomber, which is a phenomenon in the 21st century. Deeply depressed people decide to become suicide bombers. You change the equation. I'm not sure about that. I know that. All right. Okay. Well, I'm prepared I'm to not, discuss I'm that. We'll discuss I'm that. Prepared you to know discuss what we're going to do? We're going to stop it here unless you have a critical question on the lecture. And then we're going to announce something. We're going to have, I'm not sure we're going to wait for him, but we want to have like a bonus. We're going to ask uh, two things. We're gonna, this class, this group of people, uh, we're going to have a party. 
but a party of seeing a movie. I'm not going to tell you what it is. A movie that will blow you out of this, you know, earth. And we're going to have tea. Pro, tea, you know, tea is the guy who owns the cafe. <laughs> Provide you guys with tea. And maybe coffee too. <laughs> tea and coffee. Maybe he might even do juice. We'll see what he would, what he's capable of. You know, our capitalists are so, so uh, under cash flow, so I don't know how far we can pull it, but we're going to do, decide on a date. You're coming back when? 25th. 25th of June. So this is like also by then we will announce the next installments of classes, but it's a party. But be ready to stay here. I don't think you'll tell us to stop the movie. And then if you go for that, there's another movie. Two movies that we want to drop as a bomb to you on you guys. So uh, again, you want to say something, my brother? Yeah, and um, I just said after a second, so forgive me if you covered this. But there was a piece that I was wondering if um, comes in the next session, where colonialism works on the mind so well that you can't think about what ought to be outside of colonial space. So is there a piece of decolonizing the mind in the way that a lot of the theorists have talked about with the well, but decolonizing the mind means understanding what is. Because we think that what is is the right thing. Decolonizing the mind means nothing more than understanding that the model was developed specifically to get certain results. If you don't want that result, you have to change the model. What has happened, we became politically independent, but we kept the model. Now, I'm serious about that, you know. Africa, all of us, because we didn't know anything else. That's all we knew. So, so all independence meant you change individuals. Individuals change, but the policy didn't change, because we didn't understand the policy and we didn't understand the consequences of the policy. So I have people telling me now, we abhor the consequences of the policy, but we support the policy. How can you support the policy if you abhor the consequences of the policy? But because they have to say that because they don't know they're an alternative. They have not been exposed to an alternative. And our best minds have been to Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge, and so on. And they are taught the model of colonialism. That's the only thing that they know. They don't know anything else. And because if you try to teach something else, they ain't letting you in there. Right? I think, I think that in, 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 in uh, to, to look at what you're saying, in C.L.R. James's Black Jacobins, there is a statement, and this is among people with resistance, runaway slaves, etc. There is a statement by the priest, the voodoo priest, about the role of Christianity in our consciousness and why we have to break with that in order to be able, I'm coming now again to, to the inability of Christianity to deal with, with, with um, suicide bombers, all right? The inability, he, he was arguing for the slaves. They were early, early people in suicide bombers, if you want to call them that. That they had to break with Christianity, break with the French, in order to be able to arrive at their capacity to struggle as blacks. And, and in the book, CLI shows the difference between the consciousness of the black runaway slave, pre desaline and pre Toussaint, and the mulattoes who insisted on retaining the, 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 their, their Frenchness, their privilege, and their, and their Christian orthodoxy. And it is inside of that struggle, which we still ex which we, which we have today, is the same struggle today, is the same struggle with Cheek. You know, Cheek and, 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 and and Leo or whoever it is, is the same struggle, you know, of resistance. And, 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 and therefore, the, the, the ability to go there, when, 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 when Nkrumah says this is where we should go, and this is what we should do, Nkrumah encounters a, law, a, a chief judge, justice or whatever he is in, in the country in Ghana, 
who studied at Oxford, who is a, an intellectual that Nkrumah put in that job, who says, we can't go down that road. And there's a battle between Nkrumah and, the, and, 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 and this chief judge, who is an Ashanti. Nkrumah fires him. And that was the beginning of the end, which CLI writes about in terms of the collapse of Ghana from there on in. The same thing happened with Fanon. The identical thing happened with Fanon in terms of Algiers, because the Kennedys understood that regardless of the Algerian revolution, the critical issue of Algiers was oil. That was the critical issue. And we will let you have the revolution, we will let you change the Algiers, but we are going to be engaged in controlling the petroleum industry in Algiers. We have to know that as Pan-Africanists. Because if we don't have the data and we don't know all of this stuff, if we don't look at it, study it, work about it, we'll go to meeting after meeting and not solve it. I'm in a hurry for the Pan-African chapter. Yes, I am. exhausted, my brother. <laughs> but let me tell you one thing. In South Africa, as you were talking earlier also, in South Africa, part of the settlement was uh, that no black race could come to power with a nuclear yeah, war, country, right? yeah. and they had to give up that yeah. to come mm -hmm. to power. Now, yeah. I am saying Obama would be the first who would have at least the red phone. I don't know where, how far it is where the thing is, but that is an interesting prospect, that he would be the first black man to be near the red phone, to be uh, near uh, nuclear power that the option of like the, they, they leave option they leave this option open to Iran and all of us and a brother would be near it. What a prospect. Thank you very very much. <laughs> and uh, so when do we have the party we said? Azza? 25th? 25th is what? Saturday when he's coming back. Huh? That's when he's coming Yeah I know but what's 25th? Calendar, please. It's Wednesday. Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Wednesday? Uh, I, I prefer it as a, a Friday night. Uh, Thursday night? That's what you said? Okay. Thursday night? 26. 26? Okay. Good. 26. Party time to closure. Uh, to, to say thank you to him. We might even give him gifts, you know, like. <laughs> Necktie he doesn't wear when he lectures. No, don't worry about that. No, I'm joking. Same time. Well, on. Yeah, same time. Uh, let's say. So, 26 is on a Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Thursday. So, let's say 6 30, I think. Not the same time. 6 30. No? Okay, I like the same time. No, no, let's, uh, let's agree on time. 7? Okay. Yeah. 7, everybody? Good. Thank you again. Okay. I really want to say this to all of you individually. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you're giving me a lot of ideas. My, I'm floating all over the place. Uh, this thing is going to be very, very um, uh, important for us to keep it going. But it happened because of you guys coming. I'm serious. I want you to, I want everybody to up, applaud yourselves. You know, really. Seriously. Thank you for coming. It really encouraged us. It just said to us, like, we can be innovative. You know, we don't have to do the usual things. Go ahead, Tony. Go I was going to say, I was going to uh, thank Ackman for conceptualizing the Who is Obama to Me series, which led to Leo coming to our minds. Mm -hmm. And thank you for opening up your house no to problem, make this best brother. happen. So, no thank like, everybody. No thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again.